Thank you. So again, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Emily Davey. I am a research associate with CEG, and I will be facilitating this roundtable today where we will be discussing how to support clients ordering HIV self-test kits online. Um, I would like to start by introducing today's panelists. Um, first, we have Nathaniel Holly, co-founder and co-executive director of the Free Looks Project. Um, next, we have Alexa Mutchler, uh, the program manager for the Florida Harm Reduction Collective. And then finally, Katie Rutherford, the executive director of the Franny Peabody Center. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, panelists, I'd like to remind you to keep your answers to around a two minute maximum, just so we have a lot of time for everyone to speak. Um, and also for panelists, please hold your questions to the end or put them in the chat and then we can address them um, at the end as well. All right, so to start off, I would like each of our presenters to please briefly talk about your organization's online HIV self-test kit process for your clients. Um, we can start with Alexa. Um, so we have our, we actually work with Next Distro who runs um, mail-based uh, harm reduction services for the whole um, country. Uh, and so um, we have a variety of different ways people can order them. We also, um, under our program, give them out in person as well. But the postcards that we have have a QR code so they can go online, order through Next Distro. It has all of our um, labeling and, uh, you know, like our images on it so they know it's us. Um, and they just answer some questions, anonymous. Well, I guess they're not anonymous because they have to fill out their name for mail, but we don't ever do anything with uh, with that information other than mailing it out. Um, and they fill out information, relatively low barrier. Um, we just want to know some basic demographics and then whether they've been tested previously and um, how long ago they were tested, if they remember, and then we mail it to them. Um, and in the mailing, we give, we so we send the whole kit out and in the mailing, we have a couple of different um, informational postcards uh, and if we have uh, informational pamphlets for services that are in their area in the county that they live in, uh, we'll put those in there as well. Um, and for our program specifically, we target people who inject drugs. Um, so we don't ask them whether they inject drugs or anything like that. Um, but that's typically who we're targeting. But of course, if somebody orders a test from us, um, we're not going to say, you know, do you inject drugs? And if you don't, you can't have a kit. Um, we just, that's where all of our kind of marketing goes towards. That's typically the services that Next Distro provides, you know, grabs the uh, market share there as well. So that's, um, that's our HIV testing program. Thank you for sharing. Um, Nathaniel, you can go. Sure. So um, from the Freelux Project, we started our self-test program and we market that primarily. And I'm sorry about the background noise <laughs> if it's too bad. Um, but we operate primarily on social media and we uh, highly, highly utilize our social media presence to um, engage the consumer to um, request test kits. So they can either request them through a form on our Instagram page or through our website directly. And um, we, as uh, Alexa stated, like we actually don't ask for a whole lot of information. I mean, of course, we want their name. Um, their address that we're going to send the test kit to, um, but we also add just some additional general information on their age, sex, um, the last time they actually had an HIV test, and if they actually wanted us to follow up with them or not uh, once they received the HIV test. Um, so when we send it out, we send it out with a little pamphlet that has a QR code um, that they can scan. Um, it's actually three QR codes. So the one is how to actually take the test. One is how to record your results, and the third code is how to actually find uh, follow-up care near you. Um, so we try to just streamline and streamline and make it extremely easy um, for follow up care. Uh, we simply send like an email out to them uh, once they've requested the test kit to see if they want any additional communication or anything like that. But they also have the option when they report their results to either request a follow up call or to say that we no longer want any communication from the organization. So um, and, and, it, and it's been really um, re well received. Um, I feel like a lot, there are a lot of people who wanted the access to the test kits who just did not know how to get them. And so we've been able to kind of bridge that gap and not necessarily provide them with, you know, necessarily full services, but at least that introduction into care. 
That's great. And I really like uh, the fact that you mentioned social media. I think that's a really great way to do some outreach. And if you're dir directly linking the online order kit, that makes it even easier um, for people. Thank you. Uh, and Katie, you can share next. Hi, everybody. Um, so we, I'm from Franny Peabody Center in Portland, Maine. We are um, an HIV AIDS services provider. So um, we perform in-person testing through the Maine CDC. And then we also manage the state's Ryan White Part B case management and HOPWA services. So um, just as in general, that's we're targeting many different populations who are impacted or at risk of HIV. Um, we did a little bit of self-test kit distribution in the beginning of COVID, which I'm sure many of you also experienced. Um, and so that kind of prepared us for this grant. Um, but this was the first time that we allowed for ordering from our website. So um, similar to the other panelists, we have um, posters around the community with a QR code to order the tests. We've done a fair amount of radio advertisement that has um, significantly boosted online test kit ordering. And then We've also partnered with um, a, a about 15 different organizations around the state that are also serving individuals at risk um, in a pretty diverse way. So we've been able to, Maine is a, has some really rural areas. We've been able to reach 12 of the 17 uh, counties in Maine through partner distribution um, and our QR code that's on the posters around the community will take you to the same form that then branches out, whether you're ordering a test, reporting your result, um, or having any issues with the test. Um, so again, very similar to other panelists, we're collecting demographic uh, information. The questionnaire is very similar to the risk assessment that we do for in-person HIV testing. Um, and it's been great so far. We're a relatively low incident state. so sometimes that can really impact uh, or increase HIV related stigma. Um, people feel very isolated and um, nervous just coming into the HIV service provider. So I think having the HIV test kits and being able to order them or take them away to a private um, sort of personal space has been really helpful for our community. Great, thank you for sharing. Um, Next, I, you touched on it a little bit, each of you, but um, what are some of the supports that you um, offer when you send out the test kits? So maybe the items that come with the test kit, um, those things. Uh, we can start with Nathaniel for this one. Sure, uh, we provide um, just regular harm reduction, um, uh, condoms, lube, things like that, but also um, just giving them uh, information about um, the HIV rate and HIV rates and other uh, information that they should be aware of in terms of um, the data and the numbers and how they may fit into it. Um, but yeah, that's that's pretty much what else um, the other information that we send along with the test kit, just to make sure that they have access to um, you know both anything that's harm reductive, but also additional services if they need them. Okay, Alexa. Uh, yeah, so we have. I think it's three um, postcards that we put in there. Um, one is is one of the postcards I made when we very first started this program. It has a, it has some information, some kind of affirmative language of that we're here for them and that uh, we know that this is a scary time to be testing um, for HIV. And there's a QR code that links to our website that has an HIV resources page. And I'm just looking at it now. Um, we have um, information right in bold that a reactive test does not necessarily mean that you're HIV positive and that it requires further testing because we don't want them to panic um, if it becomes reactive. And um, we have, you know, this uh, mail base is housed underneath a larger HIV self-testing program where we have peers that are usually standing there with them when they get it to give them all this information. So we're trying really hard to make the key points stand out um, in a way that's going to be easily readable and not lost in the you know paragraphs and paragraphs. Um, and then I just have a couple of different uh, buttons that say I need a self test. My test was reactive or my test was negative. And depending on which button they click, that will scroll them down to the part of the website where it has what to do if it's negative, what to do if it's reactive, 
where to order one if they need it, uh, if, if somehow they land on there. And then we have a button that says anonymously report my results, uh, where we ask them to go to a HIPAA compliant anonymous drop form to just give us, again, no names or anything on this one, just demographics um, and um, whether their test was reactive. Um, and one of the postcards we actually put in there is a little business card with the same thing that says, please anonymously re report your results, QR code that goes directly to the job form. Um, and then I made a, another postcard just a couple months ago that has basically all of the same information, but just on like very quick bullet points. So what to do if you're positive, what, um, you know, information about prep, what to do if you're negative, um, and, and um, basically saying, please reach out to us if you, if you need something. But we don't put any um, we don't put any harm reduction supplies, so to speak, um, in the mailing kit itself. Just information. Thank you. And I think your point about providing them with affirmative language is really important, um, especially receiving a test kit online. I can imagine you can kind of be unfamiliar with the whole process, but if you're receiving that information in a way that seems caring um, and attentive. I think that definitely improves some things. And Katie, would you like to share? Sure. Um, so we have sort of a test, like a letter that goes in um, with our test kits. Uh, we have them translated into like 14 different languages. Many of the individuals we serve are asylum seekers um, from a number of different countries. So we try to keep track of uh, or we make it available for people to access um, the test form in different languages so we can figure out what supports they may need in terms of multilingual materials. Um, and it basically just gives, you know, the, those inserts can be very fine print and I think sometimes overwhelming for people. So the letter that we include has our logo on it. People may already be familiar with us. Um, so I think that supports them in feeling sort of connected um, and brings it a little more of a local feel um, and just gives like the really simple basics of tests and then linkage to care information. Um, we also include information around U equals U and we have a program called PREP 207, 207 being the area code for Maine. Um, so we try to get people engaged in that and those are all available in different languages as well. Um, we also, we include like a safer sex kit um, with all of the mailings and um, we also throw in a few pieces of candy. We felt that like, especially with COVID, I think that just sort of helps people feel a little more relaxed and, and supported. The letter does say not to eat anything prior to the test. So, um, so that's the caveat there. Um, and uh, we have a couple, actually one of the resources we now include, we were sort of surprised by a few out of state orders. So, um, Kelly from CEG pointed me to a resource that was created by one of the grantees um, that has a list of all of the ADAP programs. I think it's the, the direct contact for the ADAP programs in every state. Um, so that's been a great compliment for those orders that have come in um, around the country that we weren't necessarily expecting. Um, and now, I mean, we have like stickers and some other little pieces of like flat, pretty weightless swag that we throw into the um, the packages as well. Thank you. I, I, the swag and the incentives, I, <laughs> I think would are definitely a good um, selling point. But, and it's also very interesting that you get um, orders from around the country. Um, do you think that is due to your uh, social media outreach? Yeah, we, once we started seeing that come up, um, I, uh, I wish we had been asking the question from the start, but um, because we started seeing those those orders come in, we added a question. So we weren't able to capture all of that data, but at the end of the questionnaire, it says like, how did you hear about us? And we give um, sort of easy clickable answers, whether it was a community partner or Facebook, Instagram, Grindr, um, and people can sort of choose. And it's interesting to see the out-of-staters will see it or tend to see it more on like a dating app ad or a social media ad, um, which was also interesting because usually we target those ad dollars on social media with that 
geographic, like our local geographic region. So some, who knows with Facebook, somehow it's just getting further out there, which is great. Yeah, definitely. Social media can broaden everything and really get things to you where you never thought they'd go. Um, okay, great. Um, my next question is, as this is kind of a new process, I'm assuming for some of you, have you had to adapt anything on your online ordering process um, as you started to set it up? If you've come across anything that you may have needed to change? Um, Alexa, you can start this one. Um, I'm trying to think, I know just recently we added um, a, a line to ask for their email address. Um, it was actually after talking to you, Emily. Um, I realized we we actually run a, um, a statewide mail-based Narcan program as well, and we've always collected emails for that, but we added HIV self-tests after we started this program, and somehow um, emails didn't get added to that order sheet, and we actually didn't need one uh, until just recently, so it just never crossed our minds. So we added um, asking for emails. Um, other than that, we really haven't changed anything on our order form. Um, originally, we had a question at the end of our Narcan order form asking, do you want an HIV kit? Um, and we ended up making it a completely separate um, order form rather than having them together. Um, the amount of orders were just overwhelming and we didn't have supply to keep up with that. And um, I know, I assume from our data, my best educated guess is that a lot of people who are ordering Narcan are loved ones of people who use drugs. Um, and so we kind of made it a separate one to make sure that, to put a little bit of a barrier in place to make sure that the people who are ordering it are people who actually need it and not just saying, well, yeah, give me one, let's, let's see. Because we're really trying to make sure that these tests get directly into the hands of people who use drugs because we feel that they're often lacking uh, as far as resources that are available to them and um, organizations that are, are targeting specifically them to help them. Um, so creating a new order form is something we did and adding the email address. Um, but other than that, it, um, not really. We've kept this as low barrier as possible. So it's always been the same basic geographics, uh, age, uh, sexual orientation, um, uh, gender and race. Sorry, guys. I, I came back from Europe yesterday. So I'm like trying to like, remember what working is like. Um, <laughs> and then whether they've been tested for HIV in the last, uh, year or never, or longer than a year. Thanks for sharing. Uh, Nathaniel, do you want to yeah, uh, we haven't really had to make any changes, but one thing that I did see or that I did notice in terms of feedback is that there were there was a need for additional services or additional tests that they would want to do outside of just the HIV test. So currently, I, I'm looking for partnerships to expand our testing platform beyond just HIV tests because they were um, there. There's a need or a, a desire for those who are um, testing to you know perhaps have an avenue to prep. And I wanted to create that lane uh, with this self-test program being our first program. Uh, we're still ramping up our capacity, but I have seen that that's been a, a need. So we've been ramping up the ways that we refer people for those additional tests, but um, also looking for ways to partner so that we can actually provide them in-house. So that's something that we're currently working on. Thank you for sharing. I actually have a follow-up question to that. Has anyone, um, experienced feedback from their clients, um, speaking to the panelists, has anyone received feedback from their clients that kind of made you rethink or add things to your order forms? Or in that sense, anyone want to speak to that? No. Okay. <laughs> just curious. I, I was um, just going to say, I, I haven't had any feedback specifically from, from clients. Our, um, our, our HIV self-testing clients at least that order online have been pretty quiet we don't get a lot of feedback either way um but we actually our organization has a cab a community advisory board that's made up um almost exclusively of people who use drugs either now or, or previously who have that lived experience who go over all of our 
any documentation that goes into the program or into the pamphlets or anything like that. Um, so we've received feedback in that sense, but I've never received feedback from a mail-based HIV order. Okay, um, Katie, did you wanna address uh, the previous question? Sorry, I kind of went off track there. Um, but sure. just if you want to um, update your ordering process online at any time. Uh, we had to do little things kind of earlier on, like we noticed people were, um, I thought I could get away with like, please enter your mailing address here. And people were like, never including uh, like city state zip code sort of thing. So little like little things like that on a form where I had to make separate fields for like city state zip. And even then sometimes people are just putting in their zip code or um, a few uh, like address, glitchy address things where we weren't able to identify that something needed a, an apartment number and the person didn't include the apartment number. And so the test would get returned to us. Um, so we tried to just adjust the form to minimize like human error in that sense. Uh, we were able to kind of work that out um, for the most part. And other than that, um, not, I, I can't think of anything, anything major um, that we had to change. I think it was relatively easy for people to get through. Yeah, yeah that sounds good. I definitely can understand the address thing because if someone doesn't give me <laughs> a little button that says, oh, fill in your apartment number, I wouldn't do it either. So yeah, thank you for sharing. Uh, all right. Uh, my next question um, is in regards to trust from the community. So I had spoken to the panelists a little bit prior to this session, um, and I heard that building trust with clients online can be a little more difficult because they may not be familiar with your organization. So a question I had was that I'm curious how your organization has done their best efforts to build trust with the community members who are ordering test kits online, um, because I know it can be a little tricky. Um, does anyone want to start off with that one? Because I know it's a little more of a tricky yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll start with this one. Um, well, I was a patient advocate before we started this program. So I've been living with HIV for 10 years, 11 years. So, and I had already um, was already in the process of like putting that story out there. And I had already kind of gained a certain element of trust from you know, the people that I interact with online. So that was kind of like an easy transition for us um, as an organization, because me as the face of the program, you know, after living with HIV, I kind of have, um, I'm like a, a resource, become a resource just in educating people. And now that we could become a, a resource to actually provide them with HIV tests was like right in that lane. So it translated very easily. Um, I think that the, the issue that I probably have been having is um, expanding that beyond some of the, um, the target demographics that we've been trying to reach. Um, our biggest response in terms of the HIV self-test programs has been from Black women, which we included them in our target group initially, but we didn't expect the response to be as big as it has been. So we've been tailoring some of our messaging and figuring out different ways where we can target um, them more directly um, and finding people who they may trust or may um, respond to better than just me as a black gay, black gay man living with HIV. So um, just tapping into those certain communities to pull people in that have that trust already, similar to what I did, and just making sure that those they, they fit for the target uh, demographics that we're wanting to reach. So from that standpoint, it's been good um, for my own personal story. But um, I think that it was always also important to pull in people that represented the uh, demographics of people that we want to bring into the test kit program. That's really great. Thank you for sharing. I think I think bringing people in, um, that's awesome. Um, does, do Katie or Alexa, do you want to um, comment on this? Um, yeah, I, I can comment. Um, I think we're very fortunate to work with Next Distro, who's already really well known in this sphere of um, harm reduction and and um, providing services to people who use drugs. So I think when they go to the Next Distro site to order, um, a lot of times that's enough to build trust as an affiliate with Next Distro. Uh, and also, you know, we don't 
for better or worse, do a lot of advertising on social media or anything like that. Um, a lot of our advertising, so to speak, is within groups and organizations that already know who we are. Um, I mentioned that we have a mail-based Narcan program. I put an HIV order, like order an HIV self-test kit uh, uh, postcard in every single Narcan order um, that I pack. Even though uh, you know a large percentage of people who are ordering um, Narcan, I believe, are people, loved ones, or family members, that information can hopefully still get to that that um, person who uses drugs. Um, and for those who are people who use drugs who are ordering for themselves, they have that right there. And so there's already that element of knowing who we are, trusting us, we're providing them with these Narcan services and harm reduction information. You know, low barrier. Um, no um, like very invasive questions <laughs> um, that sometimes like doctor's offices and things like that can ask. Um, and so I think by trying to keep it as low barrier as possible, using the affirmative language that I talked about before, and really just kind of targeting to organizations and people and groups that already know us or know of, like I said, Nexus Shows an affiliate, um, I think that that helps um, with, with the trust. Um, I haven't thought any further than that because so far it seems to be working. Um, but as we continue to grow this program, that's definitely something that I'm going to have to try and figure out. And I'm hoping that, um, I can learn something here because that's a huge, uh, undertaking. It feels like. Thank you for sharing. And it seems like people have interests in your uh, postcards. <laughs> um, I don't know if you saw the chat, but Teresa and Jason was asked if you could share um, an example. Yeah, I'll um, yeah, I'll look for it on my computer. I've got them somewhere. I'll, I, I'll find them. Thank you. All right. Um, and Katie. Um, yeah, so I think um, one of the things I noticed, and this isn't specific to the online order form necessarily in terms of building trust, but one of the things I've noticed um, with the partners that we're working with, this whole program sort of gave us the opportunity to provide um, like HIV 101 training to partner organizations that are working with populations that we're trying to reach. In addition to linkage to care training, which was especially important. And I think being able to build that layer of trust with the community partners has encouraged individuals who may not have come to us in the first place, but um, are already engaged with a syringe exchange program or a college health program. We've, it's given us the opportunity to sort of better equip those partners with linkage to care information so they feel more comfortable referring people directly to us, or at least just having a general understanding of like ADAP, Ryan White, Papua, um, and just that those, those services exist. Um, and it, I think it's brought us closer to all of those partners and the FQHCs and our city of Portland public health for additional STI testing. Um, so I think it's just sort of that, that secondary layer of of building trust, they might, the individuals might not be coming to us yet, um, but they're learning more about us from organizations that they're engaged with right now. Um, and I think that has been just overall good for, for um, the community services and, and sort of like further integrated us. Thank you so much for sharing. All right, um, my next question is, so we talked a little bit about the positives of the online ordering, how it's how well it's doing, um, maybe some of the things you've had, the little things you've had to tweak, um, the partnerships you've built, but maybe what are some of the challenges or barriers that you see with online ordering? Um, uh, I guess Nathaniel, you can start this one again if you would like. Um, I would say probably the biggest barrier is, um, I mean, getting people to really follow up once they get the test kit. <laughs> you know, uh, we try our best to, you know, stay in communication with them. But a lot of times after that request goes out, uh, we send out an email, we don't get response back. I have one of my care navigators working on a, a data project now to do a survey to find out how they actually responded to it. 
And even with that, um, I'm finding, you know, that, you know, it's difficult to get responses from people. I think that um, we try to build, we've been trying to build like a comprehensive program, but I think that the the main tenet um, that we found is that people just want access to that care. They don't necessarily want you to call them. They don't necessarily want you to email them afterwards. They just want that access and that freedom to be able to take the test when they need to. And then if they want to contact you back, you be able to do that. So uh, I think that we went into this initially with uh, trying to build like a whole circle of care around the HIV test program. But I think the biggest uh, factor uh, or the biggest benefit that I've seen is that people just want that access. They don't necessarily want you to be all in their lives or, or how they're actually doing the test or how, what the results were. They just want to have that, um, that freedom to do it as they please. I see. So even in a sense, it's not so much about them responding to you, but at least they're getting those resources, which is great. Um, Katie, do you want to touch on this? Um, yeah, I would agree. I think especially when people are testing negative, they're like, I don't need to talk to you anymore. <laughs> um, or at least, you know, they don't. I, I, I have no doubt that people appreciate it, <laughs> but but they're not interested in reporting um, any more than they feel they need to, which is totally understandable. And I think we have to sort of part of that challenge is just getting comfortable with the fact that we are on top of um, you know, making sure that people have all the information they need to connect to care if they choose to, if they have a reactive test, if they have a question, that they have everything at their fingertips um, and they don't have to like leaf through fine print um, and just sort of like trust in that process. I, I wish people, we had found, we were, we thought that our response rate would be much stronger than it is um, because when we were handing out self-test kits curbside during COVID, we found that 100% of individuals were were um, getting back to us with their result, um, and I think it's just a factor of having been connect. Like those individuals knew where to find us; they already knew about us. That's why they were asking for the self test kit um, in that setting. Whereas this program just sort of like opened the door very wide to an audience that we hadn't reached before and they just don't have that same relationship with us at this time. Um, but my hope is that they'll just continue to utilize the service for routine testing and then know exactly where to go if they need us for anything else. Thank you. And I think your point about the in-person feedback is really interesting. I don't know if um, Alexa or Nathaniel, you've experienced some a similar kind of thing where people are responding <laughs> or are giving you feedback um, on their test results, et cetera, in person versus online. Um, I don't know if either of you have an opinion on that. No, it's been about the same. If you, even when we hand them out, um, people go ghost on us. <laughs> They're like, thank you. <laughs> we might call you later, but we we'll probably won't, but yeah. Yeah. Um... I, for the previous question and the current one, um, it, by far the hardest thing is getting people to respond back to us with their results. Um, we personally don't email them. Um, that's something that's been brought up. We might change that. Um, I see both sides of it. I haven't fully decided if I'm comfortable with breaking that barrier and emailing them, or if I just want to like leave them alone and give them their space and let them come to us. They know they can. When I send out postcards, I try to handwrite on every single one. Please, please reach out if you need us. We're here to help. Um, that kind of thing. This is still a pretty new program for us, so we're like constantly trying to figure out the best the best things to do. Um, but I, I don't know for sure because uh, there's no there's no way specifically for me to track it uh, that I can think of off the top of my head. But I don't think we've had anyone uh, in the mail base <laughs> come back and respond to us. Um, maybe a couple, but the majority, I think we have like a 20, I want to say 26% response rate, but that's almost always, almost always with um, peers who are in the field taking the test right there with the client or um, our peers who are in various parts of the state of Florida um, uh, go and see the same clientele over and over again. And they have that trust report, uh, trust and rapport built up already. So that client will come back and say, hey, 
um, Nikki, you know, I tested and it was negative or I tested and it was reactive. What do I do now? Um, there's a handful that have people have gone to the draw form and filled it out themselves, but I don't, there's no way to know whether they got it in the mail or whether a peer gave it to them or we gave it to them in person, but by far the hardest thing and the biggest barrier is getting um, a response back, uh, which I understand, you know, it's, it's sensitive information. It's a touchy topic for some people. And especially with our um, uh, demographic of, of people who inject drugs, they're pretty unlikely to trust organizations to begin with. <laughs> so that's a, that's a barrier for sure. Thank you for sharing. All right. Um, and finally, I wanted to touch on the future of your HIV self-test kit orders online. Um, and if you have plans to continue your online orders following this project, um, maybe what that would look like, if it would be similar or different. Um, Katie, if you want to start. Sure. Um, we have some funds. So we have the um, State of Maine CDC has a minority health outreach grant for HIV. Um, and so we subcontract with some providers that are reaching um, particularly the immigrant population in Maine. Um, and so there is some funding, I think, in that contract that we can carve out for self-test kit distribution in a way that we haven't been able to in the past. So we're looking forward to that in sort of as that next um, contract begins. And around the time that we were applying for this grant, the Maine CDC was formulating the um, state's integrated plan for HRSA and the Ryan White program. And one of the goals that they had written into that plan was to increase access to HIV self-test kits um, using 2023 as a baseline. So we're sort of like, okay, let's go. <laughs> like we've got our baseline numbers for you. Um, so I think, I think it gives us some good leverage to be able to say to the state CDC, like, we know how this works and how to make it work. Um, so just to be able to encourage and provide that evidence um, so that additional partners can participate in that. And there's definitely been um, some positive feedback from the state on what we've been doing. I think they would like to continue it and especially the ease of um, partner organizations being able to distribute it without like that CTR certification training that comes along with in-person testing, it just makes it more available for other providers as far as capacity goes. Thank you. Uh -huh. Nathaniel, do you want to share? Sure. Um, so as I stated earlier, we're looking at ways to diversify um, not just our HIV self-test, but also bringing in other STI tests as well. So I'm working on partnerships with a few different organizations to uh, subcontract with them um, to start a pilot program in Texas, whereby we provide a whole panel inclusive of the Hep C and uh, the creatine check for PrEP. So um, fingers crossed, hopefully we'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll be able to solidify that partnership. But I've also been um, looking uh, to make partnerships with uh, the local government in Texas, which, you know, I mean, it's Texas. So... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, y'all. We'll see how that goes. Um, I was just at AIDS Watch yesterday um, doing some um, policy action um, with some of our, our Congress people and uh, state reps. So to, just to put it on the radar that Texas needs more services and not less. So, um, you know, hopefully, you know, CDC Foundation comes back with some more money too, but we are just trying to figure out how to sustain it um, between pharmaceutical grants and um, other fundraising activities, but we definitely know that there's a need and we're going to continue to try to fill it to the best of our ability. Awesome. Uh, and finally, Alexa. Uh, Nathaniel, I'm in Florida, so I get it. Um, yeah, I, I have a feeling we're going to uh, really try and sustain this program. Uh, we have a really robust Narcan uh, ordering, like mail-based program that we are really fortunate that just got funded by the state um, this year uh, for two years. So 
um, it would be really easy to add on um, HIV and just kind of transition that to like different funding, um, whether that is continued CDC foundation uh, funding, or I, I think that we have plans to try and go to the Department of Health here and ask them for funding. We're really, really lucky that they, as in the Department of Health, um, provided us these kits in kind. So we never had to pay for these kits that we mailed out. Um, and so I am a big data person. That's my background is in economics. So when I came into the nonprofit world, I was like, look what I can do for you. Um, so I've been trying to pull some data together to kind of show them the impact that it's had. Uh, we've been doing it for less than a year. We've given out 68 kits just by mail. Um, and we really kind of ramped up the mail later uh because it was much easier we already had peers in the field it was a lot easier to just give them kits uh it really took some building to get the mail based up and running for hiv um and 34 percent of those uh individuals who ordered kits had never been tested for hiv before so we're really hitting a a, a good target audience that may um not want to go into the department of health clinics um to say hi, I inject drugs and I need an HIV kit. Um, and I totally understand why they don't want to do that. Um, so I have, I think that that it might be our goal. I mean, we're always looking for funding, um, but I think the best course of action is going to be to try and pitch our case to the Department of Health um, and try and keep getting in-kind kits from them and uh, hopefully get some funding to tack that on to our, our mail-based services, which in, in my dream one day will have an insanely robust mail-based system that sends out all sorts of harm reduction stuff all over the state. That's great. Um, thank you all for sharing. I think that's really helpful for other organizations that may have online ordering as well and kind of thinking about what that's going to look like following this project, maybe give you some ideas of what your organization can do. Great. Um, those are all the questions I had for the panelists. Um, so thank you so much. Um, now I will open it up to anyone else who has questions for the panelists. You can either pop them in the chat or just feel free to unmute yourselves. Well, I'd like to like to um, ask Nathaniel a little bit more about that form that he has on Instagram. Um, we use social uh, media as well to like promote our programming, but I've never seen the form. And so, um, yeah, where do I find that? It's just a, typically a link that I'll put on the post or whatever that drives you back to the form on our website. Oh, okay, okay. I yeah, gotcha. yeah, yeah. It's not a separate form. We try to make it oh. as easy as possible because then the data goes somewhere else, and it's like, where am I going to report from? <laughs> so I try yeah, to, you know, I, I, try to I try, I try to link it back to our website. I was just thinking I missed something, Nathan. You know what I mean? I'm like, oh, I like, oh, no. on Instagram. I need to go look at that again. Yeah, that no, you're on it, Teresa. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. You've been helpful. Yeah. Been a, a, a lot of help in the past, you think? Yeah, no problem. Um, I do. I work with um, like I, I bring in celebrities. This not this is for Jason. Um, I just did an event with Dr. Contessa from Marriage Medicine. So um, I tap on different um, I guess like social media or celebrities that have a following that ties to the demographics that I'm trying to reach. So a lot of times, like I'll bring in um, either someone who even in gay culture or pop culture has a relevant fan base enough for me to be able to tackle on our issue to whatever they're talking about. So um, I've used Dr. Contessa. We have a few other reality stars that we work with. Um, and, you know, also just tapping on um, like influential people that I see on Instagram or on social media. And then, you know, just asking them if they want to participate. And 90% of the time they do. Uh, we offer like a small stipend for them just to repost our flyer. So, um, and then if they do more, if they were, you know, willing to do a video or something like that, we, you know, move, move forward to um, engage them further with that. But, you know, use the people that the people watch. Um, I mean, I found that that's extremely uh, been valuable to um, us just getting the word out. I mean, so far, I think we've probably done about 130 test kits by mail. And all of that has been through social media um, and, and, you know, online marketing. So um, utilizing just those other platforms that are there and just, you know, kind of just stacking them has been really uh, important for us. And, and, um, and we've seen the impact.
Thanks for sharing that, Nathaniel. I think that's really interesting that you've gotten so much just from social media. And I think it's cool you're also partnering with influencers and um, other like big people um, around the community because that's definitely an attraction. I'm sure when people see that, they're like, oh, what's, what's going on? This person's talking about this program, um, this HIV self-test program. Yeah, if I can get if I can get Andy Cohen on, Cohen on it, I'll let everybody know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're trying to get Jonathan Van Ness one of these days. <laughs> hey, I have a question for y'all. Hi, my name is Zoe. I'm the team lead in prevention at an ESO in Cincinnati, Ohio. We receive CDC foundation funding for at home testing. And I do apologize if you all have already talked about this. I had to step out. I'm actually in the office today and I'm being one of the walk-in testers on duty. Um, so I apologize if you all have already talked about this. What have y'all's experiences been like with um, third-party distributors since that's one of the things we're looking to really start to build out here? I'm happy to, um, to jump on that quickly. Um, we were able to gather a lot of partners um, that that reach a bunch of different populations. Um, we worked with syringe exchange programs, college campuses, FQHCs, um, organizations serving immigrant population, um, sexual assault survivors, or or organizations serving survivors of sexual assault and violence prevention organizations. Um, main or sorry. Uh, family planning organization. So we have what's called main family planning. It's a little bit different than Planned Parenthood, but very similar that they have mobile outreach, the homeless population. So we essentially like reached out to a really wide um, audience of potential partners and, and just to sort of gauge their interest to let them know that this was available. And we made it really clear to them that we did not want to increase, you know, we wanted to be able to do this without um, any of the partners needing additional capacity. So we made it really easy for them. Um, we provided HIV 101 and linkage to care training for all of the partners so that their staff felt comfortable answering some questions, but knowing that they could just point people back to us as the referral provider. And then the only thing I ask of them, you know, because we get all the test kits um, stickered up with all of the information that they need with the QR code right on the box for them to fill that out if they receive it in person. Um, and I just check in with the partners every month to say, how many tests did you distribute? Um, I already sort of know the population that they're reaching. So I don't need much more than that from the partners. And then just checking in with what additional support, if any, that they need. Um, and we found that that's been really successful, particularly among the syringe exchange programs that have reported back to us that it's um, initiated a lot of conversations in their office around additional STI testing that they weren't really engaging with to begin with. Um, so that sort of enhanced their services. And we've also found that those organizations are the biggest um, distributors as far as our partners go. And people are coming to them and picking up multiple test kits so that they can bring them, bring those kits to their friends. Um, so it's so that trust is clearly there with those individuals and that partner. Um, so I think the biggest thing for us was just really clear, uh, concise training for the partner organizations, and then making sure that you that you're making the process really smooth and easy, so they don't feel like they need to you know have an extra person on staff or do too much data tracking. Um, if the person's scanning the QR code, then the information is coming to us, and and that's all they really need to worry about if that helps at all. Yeah, that was awesome. Thank you so much. It, um, from the sounds of it, we're on the right track since we're reaching out to very similar partner organizations and my coworker that primarily works with the program has such a training in place. So hopefully we're on the right track. Yeah, we, we work with um, third party distributors a lot. Um, we, uh, so we're we're a collective. So it's Florida Harm Reduction Collective, and that is really at the root of our organization. Is that we are a collective of not just obviously a lot are in Florida. Most are in Florida because that's where we're at. But even some nationwide ones. 
Um, and almost all of our um, distribution is by um, third party. So we obviously do, do our mail base, but we also have peers and we do hire the peers, um, a, a handful of the peers under this grant, but many of our um, peers and peer organizations that are distributing are just that third party distributors that want to be involved. Um, and um, a lot of them are syringe exchanges. Uh, we are housed within a syringe exchange as well as it like we rent from them um, and they give out our kits and things like that. And I agree it's um, in the state of Florida, at least to have a sanctioned syringe program, I believe you, ha um, you have to either provide HIV and hep C testing or provide or be able to provide a referral out. Um, so a lot of a lot of syringe exchange uh, um, employees are already familiar with HIV and have all the knowledge that they need to give a test out. So we don't necessarily provide that training um, unless they ask for it. Of course, we would. Um, but we mail them the kits. They don't have to worry about coming to get them or anything like that. We'll mail it to them. We mail them the postcards. We get the postcards printed for them. They don't have to pay for any of that. Um, I do ask them for data back, <laughs> um, but I try to make it as simple as possible. Our job form that we use is very simple. I tell them all the time, if you don't have the capacity, just they they kind of like have a form where they can jot down um, the, the demographics. Um, and a lot of certain exchanges use what's called red cap here in the state of Florida, which is a, uh, yeah. Uh, so I say, if you need to print out your red cap, I will input the data for you. I don't want that. I don't want to provide any more barriers than any more work than they already have. Um, but I, we all agree that it's important, um, not only to get these tools to people who need it, but to get that data back. Cause that's how we sustain our programs by, um, because it can be hard sometimes to go to States where we live and say, we'd like to give out HIV kits. Um, there's a lot of pushback. And so we need to have an argument ready. Um, at least I know we do. <laughs> so um, I really need that data back. Um, and they, everyone understands that. Um, and I think it's been going well. If they all hate me, they haven't told me yet. So. <laughs> Thank you so much. I, I think I feel that way about my staff. If they all hate me with my data demands, they haven't told me. So it must be working out all right. Thank you for your uh, question. Oh. I saw Jason has one. Yeah, uh, I was which I thought was really interesting. Yeah, um, awesome. It's has anyone tried to reach out to influencers through OnlyFans to try to reach sex workers? Which I know OnlyFans is a, a big thing right now. So I don't know if anyone has. Yeah, I was uh, Jason and I were having like a whole separate conversation, <laughs> but um, I plan to have <laughs> some uh, activations with a few. Um, uh, uh, I guess OnlyFans talent during Pride Month, um, just to basically help us, you know, either be on a flyer or repost our flyer or uh, come to an event or um, or um, promote one of our events. So it's uh, one of those four categories, um, but they've been all pretty receptive. As long as you, you know, come with something legit and have a like a serious offer, um, ninety percent of them have responded back either saying like, yes, this is this is good. I would love to be a part of it, or they want to like negotiate the amount. I mean, but you know, there's not much in that realm. <laughs> so I mean, they they want to they want to maximize the opportunity. I understand that, but you know, you got to get people who actually believe in the work. And so I've been able to kind of like find those people who understand the benefit that this actually has for you know the greater um, for, for the greater good. Um. Uh, Jason, I love this question because this is not something I've thought of. Um, we also target sex workers and we do that by having people on our team who have either current or previous sex worker lived experience and therefore have ties in the community. That's typically how we um, kind of make our way in. Um, but you know, talking about social media and influencers, I'm sitting here thinking, well, I don't know many influencers who, you know, are injection drug users or, or anything like that. So it's kind of not our realm, but using OnlyFans to reach out to sex workers um, is, is genius. And I might have to bring that to the team and steal your idea, Jason. Um, but <laughs> but um, it's hard in Florida because we have really draconian laws for sex workers and HIV, they can be criminalized if they know they're HIV positive and have sex, they can be criminalized for that. Um, so it's it's difficult here to even get them to want to take a test, which I absolutely understand that. 
Um, but that's at least a good thing to have on our radar if we can figure out how to work around what we're working with politically. And Florida is one of the higher places that has uh, OnlyFans creators, right? Uh, I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that statistic if I'm if I'm being honest. I've been doing some research. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a big state. It wouldn't surprise me. Um, but um, I, I just know that it's a really difficult landscape to try and get resources to sex workers. Thank you. That was a really good question. Um, and I think it brought up a good point for people to think about, for sure. Um, all right. It looks like we are at 12. So once again, I want to thank our panelists for participating and also to our audience for attending. Um, it was great. Um, thank you again. Um, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everyone.